You are the only one I can trust. Please, sir. Bones lost so much already. He made his choice. A choice only granted to someone who has lost so much already. Don't stand in this path. Welcome to HBO's The Sympathizer podcast, where we're debriefing and decoding the new HBO original limited series, The Sympathizer, which is based on the Pulitzer Prize winning novel of the same name. I'm Philip Nguyen, a scholar of Vietnamese American culture. And on this podcast, I'll be joined by The Sympathizer's creators, the cast and crew, and of course, author Viet Thanh Nguyen. After every episode, we'll go deeper into the characters, their motives, and how this espionage thriller slash cross-cultural satire complicates what we know about the Vietnam War, aka the American War in Vietnam, and its depiction in U.S. pop culture today. Looking at you, Hollywood. But before we get started, there will be spoilers. So go and watch episode six of The Sympathizer exclusively on Max before joining us back here and listening. Things are getting complicated for the captain. Today, we're diving into episode six, The Oriental Mode of Destruction, with executive producer Susan Downey and award-winning actress Sandra Oh. Then, we'll talk with the general himself, Thuan Le, and the legendary Vietnamese-American actress, Yu Jin. And finally, the sympathizer author Viet Thanh Nguyen is back with screenwriter Anchuli Felicia King to talk about the captain and his complicated duality. Let's get into this week's recap. The episode opens with the captain and the general walking into the training camp in the desert. Monsieur Tante, these men want their country back. But what they need is to be recognized, to be remembered, to be the men they once were. The general implies that the operation is funded by powerful people within the United States government. What is our charitable cause? Humanitarian aid for all the poor Vietnamese still oppressed by the commies. It's all legitimate, on the books. This is how we receive tax-deductible donations from certain generous friends. The captain is determined to find the source of this money. And so, we see him heading to the congressman's campaign. I've located great value in you people. And I value that you value us. So whatever I might do to be of value, offer to the campaign. It's a great idea. I'd be delighted to have an ethnic on the trail. Uh, Do you have skills other than being Vietnamese? When the captain confronts Sonny at Madame's Vietnamese restaurant, Sonny realizes it was the captain who tipped him off. You said to follow the money. Is there a paper trail? I can try to get you one. Get one. By any means necessary. I've got a friend of the LA Times. I can make sure everyone in America reads this story. The captain then heads to the general's liquor store, where he sees Claude and the general having an argument. When the captain enters the store, he tries to convince Bon not to go on this mission. The general interrupts their conversation and throws his keys at the captain, telling him to get in the car. When the captain and the general arrive at the hot springs, they get in, and the general tells the captain about how he lost his toes and suggests that he's doing all of this for his family, Lana specifically. He feels that he has lost her and that this will bring her back to him. Many of the younger Vietnamese refugees and many second-generation Vietnamese Americans took to America more quickly than their parents. And as they continue to reckon with the manifestations of politicized and polarized anti-communist sentiments within their own families, they're put into the uncomfortable position of unpacking intergenerational trauma and division. The captain finds the donor list for the general's operation and photographs the evidence. Alone with Sonny in his apartment, he tells Sonny that he's a communist and a spy. Then he shoots Sonny. The captain pays a visit to Miss Mori. She tells him to get far away from LA. And in the end, the captain joins the recon squad and leaves with a handful of former soldiers, Bone, 
and the ghosts of the Major and Sonny. Our first conversation today is with executive producer Susan Downey and actress Sandra O, oh, who plays Miss Sophia Mori. Susan Downey is a co-founder, along with her husband, Robert Downey Jr., of Team Downey. For The Sympathizer, she's an executive producer for the show. She's also known for her work in Rock and Rolla, Sherlock Holmes, and The Book of Eli. Sandra O oh is an award-winning actress. Some of her notable roles include Dr. Christina Yang in Grey's Anatomy, Eve Palastri in Killing Eve, and Rita Wu in Arliss. To get us kicked off, I want to ask both of you about what your relationship is to the book itself and what that, that the beginning, the inception of this project looked like for you. So I actually read the book twice before oh, we even got on the phone. That's, that's quite a, a, a daunting or a challenging task. Well, it's, it's a very dense book. <laughs> it, it is, but once you read it once and you have a sense of, okay, this is, okay, this is what it is. I have the primer down. And so for me, you know, I, I was really taken by the source material. Um, just, just I, I love the complexity of it. I mm. loved the tone he was able to capture. I mean, Viet's an incredible writer. And um, so obviously I was curious, like, okay, how is this going to be maintained and, and brought to life? And obviously with Director Park, you get a sense of the tone. But it was really once we all started talking and building on what they had set up and, and fleshing it out even more, we realized that this was an amazing opportunity for for us as a company and for Robert. And um, we just then all embarked together to find the right home for it. You know, creatively, there was just so much there and such a responsibility, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, so it was kind of that beautiful challenge that, and I'm sure, Sandra, you can relate to this, you want something that makes you a little nervous. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, are we going to are we going to pull this off? Because if it seems like easy, then maybe maybe we shouldn't do it because, or if we've done something similar, I mean, we have not done something similar. Um, <laughs> and so I think that just that high degree of difficulty, but the comfort of knowing who we were going to be, you know, in, in the trenches with, uh, mm. I, I think those were things that were really attractive to us. Mm. After having read the book as a graduate student and getting to know Via and knowing that the adaptation was coming out, it made me feel very nervous because it speaks to my own home as a child of refugees growing up in Southern California. But also, I, I want to pass this to Sandra to ask you about the book. What was it like for you to get into the character and, and, and be part of this series in that sort of way? Sure, sure. But I want to remember to ask you the question of why you feel nervous. Oh, yeah. Actually, let's start there. Because that's yeah. what I'm really interested because from your point of view, because I feel like it's, I feel like I get that. Mm. And I'm looking at you as a fellow Asian person. It's like, uh oh, <laughs> is right. it a bit of like, OK, here's a novel. Uh oh, what's going to happen? Mm. Um, and, and so can you speak a little bit about what, because that's, there's a part of that of why I am so glad this exists. Mm. So if you can, if you can actually speak wow, to what Sandra, your nervousness. Flipping the script over here on me. <laughs> yeah, I, I think um, for me, the well, the, the sympathizer is not translated into Vietnamese. Mm. And so for folks like my parents and some of the elder community members, they've not had a chance to really read or understand it. But Viet as an author, as a public intellectual, as a scholar, is someone who is quite can be quite polarizing in the Vietnamese American community. I think some of the political sentiments about the work, um, you know, it being about our, the, the protagonist being a communist sympathizer mm -hmm. is something that I was particularly nervous about in the Vietnamese American community, which is like very staunchly anti-communist. Mm -hmm. And we get a lot of that in episode six, right, with um, the congressman Ned and, and his wife Rita and sort of the reception of Vietnamese Americans in the U.S. at that time in the 70s, 80s. Um, what I was also nervous about is how the series would be able to capture those sentiments mm -hmm. and like show all these different perspectives while still, you know, being something that has very, of course, very high entertainment value. Mm -hmm. And I very, I want to very carefully use the word like authenticity, but the sort of multiple truths that exist within different communities and their relationships with the war. I think that's really well said because this is a work of fiction, mm -hmm. right? But the inside points of, uh, of uh, the emotion underneath that are all real. I really appreciate in actually episode six, you really, really start seeing this the complexity of um, Captain's um, uh, uh, 
Im- mental, emotional struggle right. that really, really starts cracking here. And I actually feel in this episode, you really start seeing much more clearly how he's actually reactionary. Right. Like he he has a whole plan, right? He feels like he's walking this tightrope line of being a spy, but a double spy. Right. And you really get into the interior of life and the motivations of the character. Mm. He is reacting from being fooled by the professor that right. it was it was him. And the altura in the previous episode. Exactly. Right? Like so so he actually reacts. He's actually reacting. And that's the thing that for me in, in the emotional heartbeat where and the complexity of this character is really, really interesting to me. And particularly as as a as a person of color, you're seeing Captain deal with all these patriarchal and white structures. Right. And um, right or wrong, you're watching him react. Um, and his unraveling is happening. That's why I find, like, in the, the heart of six, mm. episode six, I think, is what it fascinates me. Well, just to build on that, because you're totally right, you know, there's a beautiful structure that... Uh, Don and Director Park kind of pulled into this that the first three episodes is really, you know, him doing kind of the mission. Sometimes he gets slightly off mission because he's not really wanting to be in America and not sure what he's supposed to be doing, but he is still driven by his political alignment, right. as you're saying. And then he goes to, in episode four, this completely kind of fantastical place, which mm-hmm. is not yeah. real, but to him, it's the most real. It taps into something so deep inside of him. And when he is blasted, literally blasted literally, out of that yeah. episode, you know, five is just his disorientation and trying to figure out identity at that point. He mm-hmm. completely rattled his identity. And then it's exactly what you're saying, Sandra, which is six is really for the first time, even though the spycraft stuff is in full gear. He has right. a plan. He wants to figure out and follow the money and give the information to Sonny. The truth is the big change here, which then brings us through to the end, is he is now driven by emotion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so this episode encapsulates the theme, I think, more than any other of the series in terms of the duality of his character. You know, being this this spy, being someone who's aligned a certain way politically, but having this incredibly deep bond with his blood brothers and particularly Bon Mm -hmm. and seeing what he's doing. And he starts to make choices here that are driven purely by emotion. And he actually, you know, lies. This is the first time, you know, you're seeing something Mm -hmm. on screen that contradicts the story he has written, the confession he has written. And so in that regard, this is the most human of episodes, which Mm -hmm. I do think, regardless of, again, politics, you know, history, refugee or not, like it's just taps into that kind of time we all find ourselves in conflict with what we're supposed to do or think we should do versus where our heart might be pulling us. By the way, even Miss Maury's character, that is such an interesting scene when he goes to see her and she she put an alibi out there for him, but she she knows what he, I mean. It's just so complicated, mm-hmm. and there's mm-hmm. there's an understanding that she has. Or that yeah, oh, no, I, sure. I love that scene because it 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 sort of makes no sense and and a ton of sense at the same time. I'll speak about uh, just in episode six that scene mm. because it was quite complex to try and layer all those things. But that's also I'd say not only the book, but I would say in the writing of it, all the writing is uh, very. Uh, very sophisticated. Right. I would say that a lot of this, uh, the scenes in the writing, that one is an extremely oblique scene. So you're trying to kind of push through like, I see you, I get you, I'm not going to write you out, but you need to get out of here. Right. And there's a lot behind that, um, but it is written and it's played, I mean, fairly obliquely because, uh, she just won't come out. She knows that he won't come out and say it, but she needs to get the information to him to say, I see you. I never, don't ever come back here, but I'm also, I'm standing beside you. Right. And I'm, I'm with you. And I'm with you. Right. Um, I, I want to ask you too, Sandra, I mean, in playing this particular character, I, I know Viet, 
had mentioned that you were the person that he would have wanted to play, Miss Mori. In hearing that, you know, uh, and also thinking about it, your own experience and your own history, and if there's any generational or cultural baggage that it helped inform your playing oh of Miss you Mori. The, the podcast is not long enough. We have to do a separate podcast with mm. that. Uh, of course, of course. I think, uh, I, I think a lot in this piece, and I think a lot in our. Um, evolution as Asian American and also all the the different branches of Asian Americanness. We all have to deal with um, figuring out our identity as Asian Americans here and figuring out what generation we are. Like for me, I'm child of immigrants, and I am only suddenly realizing that that really means something. You know what I mean? Like Ms. Mori, kind of um, waking up to figuring out where I am in my own place in in the diaspora, in the Asian Americanness in in America and in in Canada, where my place is. Um, it, there's a constant waking up to it, um, and I know that I definitely brought that into Ms. Mori. I really, I really felt like I understood her a lot. Mm. I think that's interesting, Sandra, that you say kind of only now, really, kind of you know, dealing with it or, yeah. or, or you want to know I, I why? think that's fascinating. No. Tell me. Yeah. You want to know why these things that are so deeply unconscious within us, I think it takes decades to figure it out. Yeah. I think it takes decades for you to even have the consciousness and the awareness or the ability to figure this out. And this is also why I'm so, um, I, I feel so grateful to be a part of this project and to help bring that along and to bring my own process with it. It's like, uh, I think that's the whole thing. Yeah. And it is this moment, I think, that we, I mean, you you say this to the captain, I see you, right? And I feel like as an Asian American, we feel seen because the the truth like is really there. One of the other kind of truths that becomes revealed is that we find out that the author of the Asian mode of destruction, communism and the Asian mode of destruction, mm -hmm. is who is Richard Head, is a pen name for Professor Hammer, who is one of the uh, the, the sort of white patriarchs that um, Susan, your, your husband, Mr. Robert Downey Jr. plays. Um, you know, from your vantage point, do you have a favorite? And can you speak to some of the underlying themes or tones that you were trying to get at um, in the series with the characters? You know, the whole story is from the perspective of the captain. This is his recollection of his time in America. And as a result, there is an emotional reason that from the perspective of the captain, all these men have this common through line, which is represented in the character in, in that Robert's playing all of them. So I think that that's great. And I thought the other brilliance of it was that they are each pillar's I think that make up uh, kind of really important, influential parts of of the American culture and and politics. You have the art and media represented by the auteur. You have government with the congressman. You have education with the professor. You even have the military with Claude, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And so, again, it just was like, of course, this makes so much sense in retrospect um, that it, he got to do that. And I think he had a lot of fun kind of doing a send-up of these characters. And I think that what what Robert's able to bring to it is he is fearless in terms of he's not worried about making them, quote unquote, likable. Mm. I think one of the moments I enjoyed most in Six was that revelation moment with the professor, between the professor and the captain. And it was a side of Hammer that I feel like we hadn't seen before. He seems, um, and I think this is why the captain kind of likes him, is conflicted, but likes him because he actually seems like he's generous. He seems like he wants to help the captain. And I think all that's true. Again, nothing's nothing simple in this story and right, any of these really characters. It's not black and white for any of the it's, characters. It never is. That's that's the great thing of Viet's writing and, and creating of these characters. But that moment between them at the congressman's house when he realizes who Hammer is and when Hammer realizes that he has a judgment on him for that, I just... That I just love what Robert brought to that, that yeah. kind of steeliness. And I love what Hua brought to it. Mm. it it's just, it's a very... Um, 
poignant moment. And I just enjoyed watching him breathe those to life um, and work with director Park, work with Don um, and, and again, calibrate the performance. So you, you understand that again, they, they have levels to them, but they're also really meant to represent something. Mm-hmm. I love that scene so much because actually, you know, a lot of the characters, when you understand that oh, Robert's playing all these characters, there's a certain heightenedness, certain absurdity, certain style to it. But then it starts getting darker and darker and darker. And that moment of shift when uh, the captain sees what is truly inside uh, the professor's heart. Right. And how the professor truly sees him, us, as Asians. Um, that's, uh, again, it's like, here we are. Do we believe these are the these are the white patriarchal structures right. that are trying to, say, up the, uplift us? And then the betrayal that Captain sees again and again and again from each one of these structures, that's what's so fascinating. Right. And, I mean, yes. Susan, you mentioned the duality come, comes out in every aspect of this particular episode. And... Viet has also mentioned how inspired he was by Ralph Ellison's um, The Invisible Man and around this idea of double consciousness and being, no, like, knowing, being seen before you're seen and sort of knowing um, the sense of self-awareness being so powerful that it disarms sort of all of the different powers mm. that oftentimes are, are what the things that, like, may harm or hurt us. I feel like we see that happening here, right? Because even like in the professor, like referring to the captain as as you people, like us as the audience, we like, of course, he would say that, right? Well, I think I think a goal for all of us was to invite conversations like this. You know, the the thing that Viet did in his book is he has these multiple perspectives, and mm. and it creates all these conflicts in identity, and um, I think you know with that becomes all these moral complexities. And I think that the goal here in in making this was was to provoke conversations like you're having and to provoke conversations in general about how we are often limited by our, the perspective that we've been taught or we've been shown. Mm. I want to thank you both for joining us on the official Sympathizer Companion podcast. Up next, the general and the major's mother. I'm so pleased to welcome actors Thuan Le and Gyu Jin. Thuan Le is an actor who's been in projects such as Bullets, Blood, and A Fistful of Cash, Visioneers, and Bigfoot. In The Sympathizer, we know him, of course, as the general. Gyu Jin is a bit of an icon and is considered one of the most recognizable Vietnamese-American actresses across the diaspora. Some of her works include MASH, China Beach, Dynasty, ER, and The Joy Luck Club, just to name a few. I want to thank you both for uh, joining us for the official companion podcast for the Sympathizer series. I feel so honored to be able to speak to Vietnamese American actors who play Vietnamese American characters. I think that's something that we, I mean, we really ne- don't see it very often. No, never see it. Right? We never see it. We yeah, s- yeah ever see it, right? Yeah. Especially on this scale. So it feels like a moment for us. Yeah. I, I want to ask you, how did you get involved in the series in the first place? And how did you land in in the roles that you play? And thought I want to pass it to you. I mean, how did you how did you get involved in the series and become our general? Had you read the book prior to being casted? I I got the book uh I think around 2016 or something. Mm. And I was just so surprised and I was just kind of a bit shocked because, you know, this was written by a Vietnamese author. And I thought, well, this this is just like, you know, groundbreaking. It's great. It's it's gonna change hopefully, uh, generate dialogues around the diaspora aspect of our people. And I started reading the novel a little bit, and part of the book is is about, uh, you know, the evacuation, the escape. And it just, it was, it was really so, it was so close to my own experience because we, you know, we were evacuated by Americans, exactly like how it was portrayed and mm. and. The episode, we were picked up by a bus, drove to the airport, and went right up to a C-130 and board the plane. 
Except we we left on the twenty eighth of April. Yeah. So that was like one and a half days or so before they started to um, you know bomb and rocket rocketing the the airport runaways. Right. You know, it it hit really close to me, mm-hmm. <laughs> and I was just a little bit, uh, you know, it took my breath away a little bit. So I had to put it down, and, and years went by. Uh, up until 2022, I saw the casting call, searching for the general. So I auditioned, you know, thinking nothing of it, just sending in some tapes, and and I got a you know call back, sending in more tapes, and then soon enough, I had an audition with. Director Park and and the showrunner Don McKellar, uh, and then it started to sink into me that maybe this will happen, right? <laughs> right. After all, and, and it, you know it took about six months or seven months or so, but then by that time I knew that this was just you know this was just written. Uh, it was in the cards, and and somehow I get to do this, and I better just accept it and. And go with it. Mm. Yeah. The airport scene is so important to me. Uh, I If you uh, wouldn't mind sharing a little bit about your personal connection to the story too. Go right. Through. I became refugees within, uh, within my own country. 1954, when the French moved out, my uh, Vietnam divided into two parts, north and south. I evacuate, uh, evacuated from north to south. And uh, I became a lonely uh, refugee at the age of 15. Mm. That's so, the same, same huh? age as me and when I became a refugee. Right. Yeah. So uh, uh, I grown up in, in the South Saigon, uh, working as an actress there. And until 1975, again, the second time, the airport scene left Saigon uh, to leave the country. So the airport scene to me in the sympathizer, it was so touching for me. All night standing there to see Director Park and the production create the the, the evacuation, the same airplane, the military cargo airplane, the people running back and forth. It's so touching to me. I, I have the feeling that night I'm not an actor. I, I don't have to act. I just relieve my 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 past my mm. past wow yes and i i think even though the the series is historical fiction based in things that actually happen to real people reality has a way of imitating art at the same time and i think it's so profound that you, you all you you both are here um like being able to connect what happened to you in your refugee journeys to what we're seeing on screen right um i mean now, I think for the adaptation, the crapulent major's mother is a character that didn't exist in the book. Right. right? It was so, it was a role that was created f- with you in mind for yeah. the adaptation. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your question. Yeah. I have to, 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 to thank for that. Those um, uh, brilliant script writers, and they, they create from, of course, based on the novel, right. but they create so many new moment characters feelings when the the novel just coming out years back Viet Thanh Nguyen have a reading in Irvine mm-hmm. and then he saw me sitting in the in the audience he said oh my god uh, we we have our legendary actress Q Ching is here I hope that someday if the novel turn into screen Q Ching to be sure the Q Ching would be there right uh, so this is amazing uh, writers uh, doing that. Mm, right. Yeah. There, there is a sense of pride that I, I think I, I've been feeling as I, as I see the billboards on Hollywood that are about the sympathizer, that have your faces and, and Viet's name on it. I feel like there's something about that, like where I feel like I'm seeing myself. Um, for Antoine, you play the general. What was it like for you? I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure you pull some experience from your, your own personal history. But what did you did you need to do any research into playing this particular character, and how did you really like step into the role and show all the different sides of the general? Yeah, of course I did some research. I um, I researched a lot of generals, you know, from the the old South Republic, Vietnam Cộng Hòa, and I I landed on General Nguyen Cao Kỳ, uh, who you know was a former 
vice president of the old republic. Not only because uh, he's, uh, you know, I think represents uh, Vietnam very well. And he just has a sense about him, the way he carried himself. And just based on what I've read in the, in the novel uh, and then later in the script. Uh, but, you know, personally, the, the character of the general reminded me a lot of my father. Who, who is, you know, as, as, as a child, uh, he, he was a general to me. You know, I drew a lot of, just a lot of emotional stuff from my father. Not only because um, that he, he has the power to, to you know, make you <laughs> piss your pants right. just by looking at you. But also I think the, what I had witnessed, you know, throughout the years, you know, when we came here, you know, we had nothing. We lost everything. And he had to sort of start all over again. What he must have had to, to feel, you know, being uh, an exile stranger in such a strange country. You know, the grieving and the loss. Uh, and and you have to sort of go on and, you know, make a living and take care of the children. And so to me, that's, that's became like, you know, the general. You know, so he's he's the, the man who has lost everything, the power, you know, the country, lost the the faith and the trust of its of his own people. Even uh, he he considered himself a failure because he lost the country, and so even 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 he liked America and worked with them. He ultimately wanted to go back, you know, and reclaim the country and. And to be part of the country again that he lost, I think that's the journey of the general, right? Which is where we're at in in episode six, right? right? Where yeah. there's this there's a paramilitary that is training mm-hmm. um, to go back and 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 seize the country that they mm-hmm. once lost, right? Yeah. And we of course want, don't want to give any spoilers for the the final <laughs> episode um, as to what happens, but there is this sort of motivation that is kind of deeply rooted in maybe a trauma or a, 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 long, a sense of longing or even nostalgia for all the things that were once lost, right? right. Um, because we see in it, it, we see how loss makes itself m- that much more apparent in mm-hmm. the way that the general's life um, is being lived, right? Yeah, right, right. And I think also that, that we also see that in the way that the crapulent major's mother is... It, goes on, right? And continues mm-hmm. to live even after the death of her son, yeah. which we see. And I believe episode three or four, right? Um, Kokuji and I, I also want to, you know, not just always talk about trauma from the war, right? But there's a lot of tenderness, I think, that we see between both of your characters. Uh, the scenes that resonated most deeply with me was when you welcome uh, Bone and the captain into yeah. the home yes. and then share with them some biscuits. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, I mean, what, how, mm-hmm. take us uh, behind the scenes for that. You know, what What was that like to re- record that and... and I mean, how did you evoke that sort of tenderness for us on screen to see like this intergenerational sort of conversation happening? Yeah, well, that is amazing to me because of, uh, the writer and even the script writer create that scene. It 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 show the 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 loneliness of the mother. You know, lock herself in her in her apartment mm-hmm. uh, in this the new land, new country, different culture, different languages. Mm-hmm. So when she when she's receiving the the two young men, uh, friend of her son, right. she was so happy and and continuously talking, talking, even bring out the the most expensive biscuit that right. she been keep kept it, you know, and even uh, even uh, uh, doesn't show to her own son, so, she right. keep it. So it show how lonely the woman is, mm-hmm. you know. She yeah. she she need more of talking to somebody and having people visit her, right. you know. So this is um, a small moment, but but it say a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, one question be as we wrap up uh, our conversation uh, that I want to ask you is if you could share a memory from working on this project where you felt you know, f- fulfilled throughout the process of uh, being a part of the sympathizer? Uh, to me, we create like a family re- relationship between actors. 
you know, Sandra O and Robert Downey Jr. and Hua and, and all the young uh, Vietnamese actors come from all around the world, from Australia, from Canada, from France, from Vietnam. And of course, uh, majority is right here in America. So, but we meet each other on the same uh, playground mm. and, uh, and it, it really touched me. Mm. Thank you. Go kitchen. An toàn. <laughs> well, I echo everything she says, uh, but I do have a very favorite moment, and it's it's sort of like self flattering here. But <laughs> go for it. This is the space for that. <laughs> My first day on the set, you know, the first first time ever that I, you know, that I, uh, my first scene that I did that we shot. Um, my first day on the set, so I did it, and and director Park came to me and. And I said, oh, okay, you know, there's more notes. He's coming. <laughs> With his translator, too. Yeah, yeah. With a translator, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and then he said, Tuan, why didn't you start acting sooner? And I, I misunderstood. I thought, oh, my God. Uh, oh, no, I didn't start acting soon enough for the scene, you right. mean? <laughs> no, he said, no, no, you, you, you're just so good. You're just so good at this. Um. Then I knew that, you know, my heart was in the right place to do this job. And and I got a chance to work with this legend. And this legend. Right. Thank oh, you. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, among the cast, I, 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 I am the... The oldest, <laughs> so now my family with all the <laughs> young, they they all call me uh, auntie, go, go, sing con, auntie, and and in Vietnamese we have many different way of of, of uh, addressing uh, each other. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so they call go va con, go and con. So it looks mm. like like a family, you know. Right. Especially yeah, it's so cute, and I, I love it. I love it. We'll have to throw another longevity party for you. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Again, thank you both so much for joining me on this podcast. Over the last few weeks, it's truly been an honor to talk to the cast and crew of this historic series. It's also been a distinct honor to talk to author Viet Tan Nguyen. And for this episode, he's back with us again with Anchuli Felicia King as we near the end of The Sympathizer. Before we start, can I ask you to introduce your name and your role in the series? Hi, uh, my name is Anshuli Felicia King, and I was the screenwriter on episode six. Hi, I'm Viet Tang Nguyen, and I wrote the novel. And Felicia, I'll pitch this first question to you. Um, you've worked with predominantly Asian cast before. It's something that's not really new to you. Could you share a little bit about how it's different when the people who make the work are the people who the work is primarily about in your process and in the writer's room to have that sort of narrative power to bring them to life? Yeah, I mean, so as a playwright, I have had all Asian costs before, predominantly Asian costs before, and uh, predominantly Asian creative teams. I think it makes a huge difference in terms of like cultural cognizance, but also lived experience. You know, there is a degree to which we feel a lot more responsibility to the source material because it directly correlates to our own lived experience. And and there are things that just, you know, even working on this show, I'm not Vietnamese, I'm Thai Australian. And so uh, it was extraordinarily invaluable to have Megan in the room, to have other Vietnamese people involved in the process, to have tea, um, because there's things that I don't know that I'll miss that, uh, you know, I have like the a sort of neighboring country's experience, but I don't have the lived experience of being Vietnamese. And then also to write, screenwrite a story that is very critical of whiteness and um, white people and proximity to whiteness and white adjacency um, for, for Asian, Asian Americans. What was that like for you to include that satirical aspect of the novel and translate that onto the screen? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the novel obviously is not just critical of whiteness as a construct, but American imperialism and the legacy of like American mythmaking and media. And it's such a sort of broad and expansive critique that the novel levels um, that it was it was sort of like an embarrassment of riches in terms of trying to transpose that to the screen. And yeah, I've reflected a lot on like 
the ironic act of like trying to make a Hollywood TV show about a novel that is so critical of the Hollywood um, machine and its legacy, particularly in terms of like depicting Asianness on screen. So it felt extraordinarily valuable to have Asian people behind the scenes because, you know, like we received that media growing up. We felt the impacts of it on our own lives. Um, and we felt, yeah, we felt an extraordinary responsibility to like do the novel justice. Right. Um, I kind of want to talk about the themes of this episode and sure. how we are in this moment, episode six, where the captain coming from the explosion in episode five, he's he's rattled. Felicia, could you share a little bit about what it was, what, what, what that process was like for you? Yeah, I mean, so there were a number of like interesting adaptive challenges in transposing this part of the book. You meet Rita, who's the congressman's wife, much earlier in the novel. Um, but for various reasons, we hadn't been able to fit her in. And so this episode really became about creating a set piece where we could meet the congressman, we could meet Rita, and we could create a sort of logistical reason for uh, the captain to be there and have to have to perform spycraft in order to like get into the congressman's house. And so we came up with this idea of setting it at a campaign rally, basically. And that way we could bring in the idea of what happens in the novel is they have this sort of like really horrific discussion about like, the, and it's and it's sort of... Um, brutally ironic where they're talking about the fact that the Vietnam War, like the reason they lost is that they were like too humane <laughs> um, and that, you know, like they value human life more than the Orientals do. And that's the, and um, and so we tried to transpose the thematic content of that scene into the congressman's speech that he's given at the campaign rally and the idea that, you know, there's these sort of like proud World War II veterans that stand in contradistinction to these um to the Vietnam vets who are so sort of dispirited and disillusioned by the war that they've just fought in. So that was like a big change that we made to try and preserve what happens thematically at that point in the book. Um, and then the um, the revelation that Dr. Head, whose book has sort of recurred throughout the show, is in fact the academic Richard Hammer, who we have met throughout. That was something that Don came in really strongly with that idea that he basically wanted him to be like a two sides of the academy, basically, and the idea that you could sort of espouse seemingly left of progressive politics um, and be part of, you know, Oriental studies, um, but actually have these extraordinarily like racist ideas undergirding that. Um, so the idea that he was actually the novel, the author of this racist novel um, was, yeah, Don's. And he doesn't yeah. hide that he's a dickhead. Too, yes. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that revelation for you, Viet, watching the the episode, I mean, did it capture the the essence of the themes that you're trying to get at in these sorts of relationships between the the captain and these these characters or these these systems in this sort of way? So let me just say that I actually have a copy of Asian Communism and the Oriental Mode of Destruction that the prop department was kind enough to give me. Oh, that's very nice. Yeah. <laughs> wow. And and I got I got Robert to sign it. As oh, Richard Head. That's so delightful. for me, this is just my one of my takeaways from the show. But <laughs> but uh, you know, it it we talked before, Philip, about the collaborative nature of the TV series and how you have to trust the collaborators and they will come up with their own vision of things. And here we have a very important example of that because certainly in the novel, it's not the case that mm -hmm. Professor Hammer is secretly Richard Head. Yeah. I don't have a problem with that transformation. You know, they're, they're, it's been made for various kinds of reasons that Felicia uh, explained. And I'm I'm just trying to remember now because I wrote the novel so long ago whether I even gave Professor Hammer a first name. Yeah, I don't think so. I don't think so. So yeah. there was you or Don, whoever, who came up with Richard Hammer, R.H. Richard yeah. Head. Yeah. And so it was serendipity that there was an, an H in there. Um, so it's just really interesting for me on the outside to listen to, Fel to Felicia and to get some insight into some of the creative, you know, adaptation process that had to, that had to be undertaken. And, you know, it, it, she's absolutely right. You know, you have to find ways to rearrange things so that they work in a seven-episode series instead of a 26-chapter novel. And then there's other factors that come into play. Like, I thought the actor, actress who played Rita was marvelous. I, th I thought she was hilarious. And she embodied exactly who I thought Rita was mm. in that moment. And for me, it was important to make Rita Cuban. Mm. Um, for obvious reasons, I think. Well, I don't know if it's so obvious, but, you know, Vietnamese, Cubans, we share the same kind of, at least exiles in the United States, the same sense of of resentment and mm. anger and desperate hope that we'll be able to reclaim our anti-communism yeah. in the yeah. community. Yeah. Yeah. And so it was, that was, that was 
one, that was a very important reason to make to introduce her into the novel and to make her uh, Cuban American, and and the screenwriters did not shy away uh, from that part of it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I thought I thought there's a lot of uh, again satirical humor yeah. going on in this scene at the uh, the congressman's house and and fundraiser. Yeah, and I think that parallel that you're drawing between the experience of Cuban exile and how sort of rapidly they turned against communism, there is a sort of parallel, but very distinct cultural experience there. And it felt like, well, one, um, we wanted to buffet the parts for female characters um, in the show. And also it felt like you would really be missing a key part of the conversation if you excised Rita. So we we sort of had to contrive a way to, yeah, make her character a little larger in this episode um, and also to give her a sort of complete arc in this episode um, rather than just having her sort of be attached to the congressman. You kind of get a bit more of her you know, her feelings about this marriage that she's trapped in. Um, and yeah, she's she's marvelous, that actor. I think she she plays it right on the line of like, you know, caricature, but she's she's very, she's got a like twinkling intelligence behind her eyes that makes it really delightful to watch. Viet, could you speak to how the theme of loyalty and betrayal comes up um, in an almost full circle sort of way for episode six? I grew up, again, uh, surrounded by Vietnamese people and surrounded by these notions of loyalty um, and betrayal and blood brotherhood and so on. Not that I was ever really a part of it, but I was witnessing it and even as a young boy uh, feeling the sense of macho uh, comradeship with other Vietnamese kids, you know, and that as early as a second grade, I remember there were like gang fights. They weren't really violent, but, you know, just like little boys ganging up on each other. They're all Vietnamese, but we chose sides. And then if you were on one side, you had to swear loyalty to the guys on your side. So somehow these ideas of intense loyalty and, you know, never backing down from, with your friends and so on, specifically if you're Vietnamese, had, was already percolating in this refugee community. And I, I never forgot that sense of Vietnamese brotherhood and loyalty um, and that it was that it was both powerful and hospitable because you wanted to have these friends and also really dangerous because – the people I was most scared of growing up were Vietnamese guys. You know, like you do not look a Vietnamese guy in the eye if you don't know him because you have no idea what kind of ramifications would take place. So when it came time to write the novel, that 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 idea of blood brotherhood, loyalty, undying devotion was at the very center, was going to be at the very center of it. But it was also a metaphor for the civil war um, between the North and the South, um, you know, brothers who should be brothers or siblings who should be siblings and nevertheless are fighting each other to the to the bitter end. And there are uh, intentional and unintentional consequences for that. And here in episode six, we see that very vividly, obviously, uh, with the the murder of, of Sonny. And Sonny is actually, you know, based on a real character, like a real personage, and also based on the fact that when I was gr- growing up, there were definitely reports of, of Vietnamese-American journalists and editors being targeted for assassination and, and, and intimidation and so on. And uh, there really was a Vietnamese-American uh, leftist activist who was gunned down in the street in San Francisco. And so he helped to provide the inspiration for, uh, for Sonny. Um, and Sonny and our captain, they should be brothers. They, they are somewhere in the same universe of political convictions. But because of this other complicated history of civil war and revolution, they are not brothers. And yeah, that was, um, I mean, I, I think that scene, we've preserved a lot of the scene as written in the book. And I think that's from my first draft. Like, I just thought it was so inherently tense and dramatic the way that you written down to the dialogue and the the sort of the crackling of the radio the, their discussion of what's going on in Cambodia so I was really pleased to see in the final cut that that stuff made it in because I think it's one of the I mean in some ways it's like the crescendo of that point in the novel so it also does feel like the crescendo of that point in the episode yeah and a sort of cathartic moment where the the captain for at least a brief moment doesn't feel as alone mm. in his revelation to Sunny. Um, before he murders him, that he is a communist spy. Yeah. And that there may be some ideological solidarity, if we can even call it that there, between them that exists. And I want to talk about Miss Mori and Sajra Oh, who we had earlier on this episode, talked a little bit about what it was like for her to play this very uniquely Asian-American character mm-hmm. and the the moment of solidarity that she had with the captain after Sunny's murder, right? Mm-hmm. That interaction between them. Um, can you talk a little bit about how that came to life? Yeah, I mean, we 
tried to wrap up Miss Mori's whole story in that one scene where he comes to her apartment. And and in some ways, p- part of it was like the classic like l- logistics screenwriting question, which is how do you make sure that the captain can get away scot-free for this murder in which he's... Um, uh, there's going to be coughs. There's, you know, th- because, because and we've and yeah. we've we've spent, you know, with the crapulent major, we've dispensed with that by making it look like an armed robbery and all this stuff. But it, it really does look a lot more like a political assassination when Sonny gets killed. And so we really liked the idea of Miss Mori providing an alibi for him and this sense that even though they have a really fraught relationship, she has always seen something in him. She's been able to recognize that he is conflicted from the moment that she first meets him. Um, And she's been able to recognize that struggle within himself between these two diametrically opposed forces because she recognizes it in herself. And so I think it's quite beautiful the way that Sandra plays that scene where it's so clear that she's bruised by it. She's devastated by the loss of Sonny, with whom she also had a very unique connection, but equally she has this sense of loyalty. You know, I think a lot of this episode is about the clash between our personal and political convictions and the idea that sometimes the personal trumps the political. And I think that's, that happens in that scene and then it happens with Bon and the captain as well. This idea that ultimately... Um, He disobeys a direct order from his superior because um, he wants to protect his blood brother. And I find that scene of him cutting his hair and and them taking off on the flight together. I mean, I think that their relationship is really, really beautiful in this episode. In some ways, they have to go back because it's the only thing that's keeping Bon alive. I one of talking about beautiful lines that he has in the book, Life is a Suicide Mission, which is from the book. I've always found the sort of like romantic nihilism of that to be really beautiful and yeah I think it's it's very touching when he says to the captain thank you thank you for keeping me alive for this long because I think that's part of what the captain has been doing from the moment they touched down in the states is keeping him like from killing himself at the end of the episode there are more ghosts and and Viet I believe it's you that said haunted and haunting human and inhuman war remains with us and within us, impossible to forget, but difficult to remember. And you also, I think, mentioned that ghosts are both human and inhuman. Can you dive a little bit deeper into that and the role of ghosts as a a narrative framing for the series? Yeah. I also wrote in one of my short stories that um, I know I believe in ghosts because I fear ghosts. I know I don't believe in God because I don't fear God. Uh, That's from the refugees. So, you know, ghosts um, are, you know, ghosts are a sign that, a terrible injustice has been committed and that when they appear, they're bringing that history of that injustice with them and they want that injustice investigated and told. So I think that they're a very powerful metaphor for so much of, of, of history, um, especially for the, in this case, the Vietnamese refugee population, because the, I, I felt when I was growing up that we were haunted by the past. Um, even me, who who didn't really wasn't old enough to remember anything, the fact that everybody else around me was haunted meant that I was haunted as well. And so ghosts um, become a very good metaphoric reference to that idea that we are overshadowed by what has happened. And of course, for for many Vietnamese people, they really do believe in ghosts. And I don't know if I do or I don't, but because I, because the ghosts are real to a lot of Vietnamese people, they're real in the novel. And in writing the novel, I wanted to make that as literal as possible. Mm-hmm. Um, we don't know for sure whether the ghosts are there or not, but they certainly are there for the captain. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Alicia, on ghosts? Yeah, I think, I mean, the ghosts are such a sort of vital device in the novel as manifestations of the captain's guilt, but there's also something sort of beautifully mundane about them and the Mm. way that they're characterized in the novel and the way that they've been depicted on screen. They're, um, they're not sort of like... They're not like ghoulish. Yeah, they're not ghoulish. They're not frightening. And because I think ultimately they, they're psychological ghosts rather than supernatural ghosts, if that makes sense. Mm. Yeah. And I would say it kind of speaks to a certain like Vietnamese, American, Vietnamese cultural sensibility around ghosts too, as not those that, you know, we see in all these horror movies that American cinema kind of, like, I'm thinking about, like, horror film ghosts in Hollywood, right? Like, they are, they exist, and they are there, and they're mundane, like you sort of said, right? Mm. And And they live, in a way, they live with us, right? Even if they are unliving, so. 
buckle in, y'all, <laughs> for the last episode. Thank you both so much, Felicia and Viet, for joining us for the podcast. Thanks. Thanks, Philip. And that's it for us today. Thank you to Susan Downey, Sandra O, oh, Duan Lei, Yu Jin, Anchuli, Felicia King, and as always, Viet Tan Nguyen for your time. We'll see you all again next time when we dive into our final episode, episode seven, with Zui Nguyen, Fred Nguyen Khan, and returning guests, Robert Downey Jr., Hua Shan Day, and Viet Tan Nguyen. The Sympathizer podcast is produced by the Mashup Americans for HBO. 